And we're moving on to a debate. The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 1595 in the name of Liam MacArthur on the 50th anniversary of the Long Hope lifeboat disaster. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Liam MacArthur to open the debate. Mr MacArthur, please. Thank you. Danka Patrick Coxon, James Johnson, second Coxon, Rebecca Patrick Bowman, Robert B. Johnson, mechanic, Jimmy Swanson, assistant mechanic, Jack Kirkpatrick, Robbie Johnson, Eric McFadden, lifeboat men. These are the names of the eight men who perished when the Long Hope lifeboat, TGB, capsized in high winds and heavy seas in the Pentlands uh, Firth on the night of 17th March 1969. Fifty years on and neither the significance nor poignancy of that tragic event have diminished. In seven minutes, it's not possible to do justice to what happened or the bravery of those who lost their lives that night. But it's right Parliament has an opportunity to mark this anniversary and pay tribute to Dan Kirkpatrick and his crew. I'm grateful, therefore, to the many MSPs from all parties who signed my motion, allowing this debate to take place, uh, and to those colleagues uh, who are in the chamber this afternoon. Of course, there have been many tragic events where the loss of life has been considerably greater. Yet the fact that these eight men died in the selfless act of trying to save others helps explain, I think, why it had and continues to have such a profound impact on the public consciousness. But it would be to do a disservice to the memory of Dan Kirkpatrick and his crew to focus today solely on what happened that fateful night. They all, of course, had lives well beyond the involvement with the RNLI, but even in this, their wider achievements deserve recognition. This was a crew that had shown its worth, proved its mettle over the years, saving many lives and receiving uh, numerous awards for bravery. Indeed, the week following the disaster, Dan Kirkpatrick had been due to travel to London to receive the RNLI Silver Clasp for the bravest act of life-saving in 1968, acknowledging the heroics he and his crew performed in saving 15 men aboard the Grimsby trawler Ross Puma. This was their third such honour. He would have vigorously rejected any such suggestion, but Dan Kirkpatrick was something of a celebrity. As well as the RNLI silver medal in clasps, he received a British Empire medal and even appeared on This Is Your Life with Eamon Andrews in 1963. All a far cry from the events of Monday, 17th March, 1969. The lifeboat was launched just before 8 p.m. in response to a call from help for help from the Liberian cargo ship SS Irene. It was reported to be in difficult east of Orkney, uh, apparently out of control, drifting in a southeasterly uh, Force 9 gale that had been blowing for days, creating mountainous waves of up to 60 feet. As it turned out, the stricken vessel was to run aground at Grimness on South Ronaldsey, where the crew of 17 were brought so safely to shore by the Brochness and Dearness uh, Coast Guard teams. It was a textbook rescue by Breach's Boy, for which those involved were later honoured. Yet amid, amid the relief, there was growing anxiety about the fate of the Long Hope lifeboat. She was spotted by the Pentland Skerries uh, lighthouse keepers around 9.30 p.m., but radio contact with TGB had been lost an hour or so after she launched. As those on shore clung ever more desperately to the hope that this was just a radio fault, a massive air, sea and land search operation got underway. This continued all through the night and into the following day, when shortly after 1 p.m., the Thursday lifeboat sent word it had found the upturned TGB four miles west of Torness in Hoy. Precisely what happened will never be known, but a fatal accident inquiry in June 69 had evidence that it was likely that the mountain and seas broke two of the windows at the front of the wheelhouse, allowing water to rush in, sweeping the coxswain from the wheel and so losing control of the boat, which then went broadside to the sea and capsized. The vessel was towed to Scrabster Harbour where it was righted and the bodies of Dan Kirkpatrick and six of his crew were retrieved. Sadly, Jim Swanson's body was never recovered. Needless to say, expressions of sympathy, condolence and support were quick to flood in from all over the country and all parts of the globe. An appeal fund for the families soon exceeded £100,000, while the funeral and memorial services in Long Hope and St Magnus Cathedral drew thousands of mourners and well-wishers. Uh, yet, as the Orcadian reported, the whole of Orkney sorrows over this terrible calamity, but only in Brims itself and Long Hope can the utter tragedy of it be felt. Brims is a small township at the time numbering 30 people, 
such a catastrophic loss at a stroke of a quarter of the population is quite unimaginable. More than that, the eight men who lost their lives included two fathers, each with two sons aboard, prompting the local MP, Joe Grimman, to question whether the RNLI should be allowing fathers and their sons to be going out in the same lifeboat on such operations. All told, the community of Brims was left with seven window widows and ten uh, fatherless children. But as Howard Hazel explains in a fascinating account of events, there was no recrimination or bitterness from anyone who'd lost their menfolk. He quotes Margaret Kirkpatrick, married to Dan for 29 years, who said, I have no regret about the boat being lost on its way to help others, because that's why it was there. Adding, I'm happy that the lives of the crew of the Irene were saved. Margaret was named Scotswoman of the Year at a ceremony in Glasgow later that year. And her sentiments were ones shared by the rest of the community in Brims and Longhope, who were anxious to see the lifeboat replaced without delay. When this happened, albeit on a temporary basis initially, in August 1970, local lifeboat secretary Jackie Grote said, the arrival of another boat is what we've been working and waiting for. It is already bringing a new outlook to the community and a much lead needed uplift. With no lifeboat here, we have felt something vital missing in our midst. Fast forward 50 years and how fitting that Kevin Kirkpatrick should be carrying the mantle of coxswain. I'm in no doubt at all that his grandfather Dan and his father and uncle would be proud beyond belief. It just so happens that Kevin's wife Karen, like her husband, also lost her grandfather, father and uncle in the tragedy. Perhaps unsurprisingly, their son Jack and daughter Stella are crew members in Kirkwall and Long Hope, respectively. It is clearly in the blood. Looking ahead to the commemorations this weekend, it will be an opportunity to reflect, pay tribute and give thanks. As Kevin Kirkpatrick says, what happened that night is part of our history. We want to mark the 50th anniversary as we want to remember them, probably in a quiet way, as that is normally the way we do it. Ahead of those commemorations, I'm delighted the Longhope Lifeboat Museum has been refurbished following a remarkable public response to an appeal for donations. It really is a wonderful facility. Deputy Presiding Officer, 17 months after the fatal capsizing, as TGB returned to service in County Donegal, a memorial to the eight men who lost their lives was unveiled by the Queen Mother. At the ceremony, Reverend Ewan Trail spoke powerfully of the disaster and its victims. These men were not saints, he said, but essentially they were good men. They had qualities which constituted greatness. As a crew, they were unsurpassed anywhere in the world for efficiency, judgment, for loyalty, and for courage. Inscribed on the base of the memorial are the words, greater love hath no man than this, that he lays down his life for his fellow men. They were truly the heroes of Long Hope. I'm pleased that Parliament has the chance to honour them today and look forward to the contributions of colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr MacArthur. I can remind all members who wish to speak to press the request to speak buttons now, Ms Grant. Uh, call Maureen Watt to be followed by Jamie Harper Johnson. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I thank Liam MacArthur uh, for uh, submitting this motion and raising it today um, as members' business. As soon as I saw it, uh, I wanted to speak in this debate. I remember it very well. I remember all the media sources in our house being on for any update about this uh, tragedy. And that was because my uncle, um, I think his job title would have been chief engineer of the RNLI. And his job was to go around all the lifeboat stations in the northern half of Scotland to check their seaworthiness and I suppose give them regular services. Um, so he knew all the lifeboat men and he knew them particularly well as an Orkney man himself with a name like Alec Cursiter. It was obvious that he was an Orkney man indeed from Stromness. And I remember, as I say, us listening to any update that we could get about the Long Hope uh, lifeboat disaster. And I remember my uncle being very badly um, affected by it, as I say, because he knew all the crew very well as he was born and brought up in Orkney himself, although he lived in Aberdeen at the time, but he had to dash up there. And I remember seeing him on the television um, quite a few hours after uh, the tragedy while people were waiting for uh, news and uh, 
to see what had happened to the lifeboat. As Liam MacArthur said, um, there has been a Long Hope lifeboat uh, in Orkney since 1874 um, and was replaced very quickly thereafter. And so many members of the community of Brims were affected by it. Um, it was uh, shortly afterwards, within the year, that there was a similar disaster um, at uh, Fraserburgh, and the Fraserburgh lifeboat was lost in one wintry Jan January morning, um, calling to, it was responding to a call to go assistance to assist a Danish vessel, fishing vessel. And it seems that the same thing happened um, with that one. And of course, both these tragedies led to the fact that the, the design of the uh, lifeboats was then changed shortly afterwards, so that there were now self-writing vessels, and fortunately, RNLI and lifeboat disasters have gone down significantly uh, since then. But it is unfortunate that both um, disasters um, had to lead to new vessels uh, being designed. Um, it is important to remember that uh, the lifeboats and the RNLI is a voluntary organisation and I take my hat off to all those people who are prepared to put their lives at risk in, uh, in, in the uh, pursuit of, of helping others and I think we should never forget that and donate to the RNLI when we can. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Jamie Halker johnson to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Mr Halker johnson please. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer, and thank you to Leah MacArthur for bringing this um, motion uh, debate to Parliament, something of uh, great poignancy for, for our islands. On the 17th of March 1969, if you looked out across the Pentland Firth, you would see a broad strait that had for seven years been bat several days been battered by gales, lashed by heavy rain, and seen snow hurled across it by the winds. My home in Orkney overlooks the island of Hoy, with long hope tucked behind. And I've seen uh, often how changeable the environment can be, the tides are amongst the fastest and strongest anywhere on earth. And that energy which today we look to harness as a power source makes an inhospitable climate for seafarers. That night the lifeboatman who set out to assist another vessel, the Irene, did not come home. Their boat was a wooden construction much different to the lifeboats of today. Their, their vessels were strong but as been mentioned, unlike many modern lifeboats, they couldn't self-right when they found themselves capsized. Visibility was virtually nil, the waves were 60 foot high. And as day broke, lifeboats from Kirkwall, Stronzi, Stromness, and Thurso searched the scene. The bodies of all but one of the Long Hope's lifeboatmen were recovered, still with their boat. The eighth, James Swanson, was never found, and the islands mourned. We see among the names of those eight men lost, three Johnstons, James, Robert, and Robert, and three Kirkpatricks, Dan, Jack, and Ray. Eric McFadgen was the final name among the dead. Orkney is a small place, and tragedies like this are felt not just in the homes and in the streets, but across our islands. For these two families, the tragedy must have been hardly bearable. And Brims, that small community on high mentioned by Liam, MacArthur, where the lifeboat was launched, has seen its population decimated. Yet you still find the relatives of these men still faithfully serving the RNLI in Orkney. Another, Kirkpatrick, Kevin, serves as coxswain as a co at the Long Hove lifeboat station. He lost his father, grandfather, and uncle that night. But he, as he says, being in the lifeboat is a way of life. It is in us. It is in my blood. My home in Orkney overlooks Scapa Flow, and the flow is one of the great, world's great natural harbours. When bad weather threatens, it is a refuge for some of even the largest boats in the world. Because if you stand on the cliffs at Yesnaby or you travel to the South Isles in a storm, you'll understand just how ferocious the seas around Orkney can be. No one who lives in an island community like Orkney needs to be persuaded of the importance of the RNLI. It is part and parcel of the heritage of the islands and touches so many of us directly. When I was young, my mother chaired the local Ladies Lifeboat Guild. So from an early age, I helped fundraising efforts to support the lifeboat's work in Orkney. But more importantly, I learned of the commitment of those men, of their sacrifice and of their bravery. And we recognize that bravery of these men today, not just on that ill-fated voyage, but for every other launch where they put their lives in danger to help and rescue others. It was not the first night that the Long Hope lifeboat crew were far from home amongst challenging weather conditions, nor was it the last. 
because still today the lifeboat remains at Long Hope, well over two centuries since it was inaugurated. Still facing those same conditions that over the centuries, Orcadian lifeboat crews have battled again and again. Outside of Orkney, lifeboat stations can be found, excuse me, Outside of Orkney, lifeboat stations can be found at many other coastal and island communities across the British Isles. They too have a long heritage, as has been mentioned, and fair share of tragedies between them. Yet still those brave men and women, self-funded mostly volunteers, venture out, facing down grave risks simply to help others. They share their successes, and when tragedy hits, they mourn together. So it is fitting that to mark this 50th anniversary, the RNLI flag will fly at half-mast at the organization's headquarters in Poole. It will also be lowered at lifeboat stations around the country. But as always, they will remain on call, ready to respond, as they have for centuries. That is the most fitting tribute to those eight men from Orkney who didn't come home. Thank you very much. I call Rhoda Grant to be followed by John Finney. Ms. Grant, please. Thank you, presiding officer. I too would like to congratulate Liam MacArthur on securing this debate and his moving tribute to them uh, today in the Parliament. And it is an issue he has brought to the attention of the Parliament on a number of times and it's fitting therefore that he marks the 50th anniversary here too. This dis disaster devastated Hoy and especially the small community of Brims that experienced such a great loss. Eight people lost to a small community not only creates heartbreak but it can also break a community too. The people that were lost were not only essential to their community for the, their work on the lifeboat, they had other roles to fulfill. To lose a quarter of your community in one night is difficult to come back from and it's a testament to the strength of those who remained that they have supported the families and gone on to provide a fitting tribute to those lost. The personal loss was enormous too as we've heard. To lose one family member is tragic, to lose generations is unimaginable. The events surrounding the tragedy are well known. As others have said, the crew of the TGB did what lifeboat crews do and they responded to a call from help from the island. There was a storm and the island was adrift in the Pentland Firth, a notoriously dangerous stretch of water. The conditions were atrocious and on the way home, the lifeboat capsized and it's not altogether clear what happened because all hands were lost. The tragedy brings home to us the sacrifice made by those who provide voluntary emergency services. Lifeboat crews and indeed mountain rescue teams are very similar given the dangers they face doing what is largely voluntary work. They love the sea or the mountains and that motivates them to do this. Since the tragedy, lifeboats have been developed to be self-writing, as Maureen Watts said, and therefore, if they do capsize, they will write themselves, so th those in them have a better chance of survival. This makes their life-saving work a little safer for them. However, it remains extremely dangerous. Trying to get close to other vessels in high seas, to be out on deck in conditions that are perilous, are still putting their own lives at risk. And therefore, it's right that we mark that sacrifice with this debate, not just for those lost on the TGB, but indeed for all those who have lost their lives trying to save others. I'd also like to pay tribute to the work of the community in Orkney, who have more than achieved their target for maintenance and repair of the Long Hope Lifeboat Museum, and th that is a, which is a memorial to the crew of the TGB and other brave lifeboat crews. This is a lot more than the community had to raise to establish the museum originally, but they have achieved it. And there's also a memorial in the Kirkhopic Cemetery among the graves of those who died that night. As Liam MacArthur said, the TGB itself was recovered and towed to Scrabster by another crew, and I can only imagine how they felt. While they recover crew and boats as part of their normal activities, doing this for your own must be very difficult. It also seems strange to me, and it's difficult to contemplate that the TGB returned to service in Ireland. And I wonder how the lifeboat crews felt sailing her. That said, she continued to provide a life-saving service and is now in the Scottish Maritime Museum in Irvine. 
The tragedy led to the RNLI introducing self-writing um, lifeboats, and that means that those lives were not lost in vain, and I'm sure many lives were saved as a result of this development in the design of boats. However, we must never forget the risks these crews continue to face and use this debate to thank them for that, to thank all of those who volunteer to save lives in very dangerous circumstances. Thank you very much. I call John Finney to be followed by Donald Cameron. Mr Cameron will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Finney, please. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. And as the custom, I congratulate Liam MacArthur on bringing this motion, and particularly in the very fine speech, which was a, a fitting tribute to, to, to the community that he's the constituency member for. Um, I was 12 years old when the, the disaster occurred and uh, living in rural Lochaber, um, Lots of communities were, had disasters, um, I recall a, a multiple fatal accident involving northeast fishermen returning where uh, that had a significant uh, impact uh, on the communities there. Also recall the community grief when police officers, uh, uh, Detective Sergeant Aaron Lumsden and Constable Ian Ritchie were killed in the Caledonian Canal. Um, they were part of the volunteer then Inverness Borough Police sub aqua team searching the canal locks for a missing person and both officers were trapped and lost their life. And it was only a matter of four months later, uh, on the 17th of March, 1969, that uh, the Long Hope disaster um, occurred. And many people have very vividly outlined the circumstances of that, um, capsizing, going to the aid of the Liberian vessel and the entire crew losing their lives. Um, communities deal with tragedies in different ways. And of course, there would be a lot of people um, affected by that. It, it, I, I wasn't aware until speaking to Linda, a member of my staff, uh, her father-in-law, Ian Williamson, was the policeman there. Um, the the uh, medical profession would have had, the Coast Guard have been alluded to it, it would have had far-ranging effects. Uh, now, in, in earlier this year, we, we had the centenary of the Isle Air disaster that was talked of in here, and, and much comment was about how the communities in Lewis and Harris dealt with that grief. They dealt with it by not talking about it. Um, but what was apparent, and will be the same, of course, in Orkney, is that uh, uh, communities will never be the same again. Looking at the, uh, the, the weather conditions, and a number of members have alluded to that, the Force 9 gale, the near zero visibility, the spring tide, resulting in waves over 60 foot high. And that's something I remember reflecting on, you know, two and a half times the height of your house. That's a, an astonishing statistic. And people have talked about one of the positive outcomes that came, which was the, the design change that saw the vessels being um, self-writing. I'm a big fan of the Canadian uh, folk musician, um, a, uh, Gordon Lightfoot and people may be familiar with the song The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald which talked about a, a similar tragedy in the Great Lakes much celebrated and at his concert he's often said um, how many vessels perished that year and the reality is that um, uh, there were 48 ships lost that year the importance of one being remembered by that song I think we have a unique situation where the community will not allow the circumstances of the the uh, loss to be to be forgotten and um, Maureen Watt talked about keeping abreast of the news and of course people <coughs> maybe would struggle to understand that that there isn't the flow of news that there is now and it would be radio and television uh, radio uh, television to a lesser extent and, and newspapers I think it's important to say we uh, we occupy uh, islands off the coast of continental Europe there's many treacherous waters that's been alluded to and there's none more treacherous than the Pentland Firth and that's why it's sought to be harnessed now. And we do need volunteers both at sea and on land to support that. And, uh, and I'm sure that um, those who lost their lives would be very proud of their, uh, their descendants and they, them continuing that. I was brought up in a household that placed great significance in helping others, valued public uh, uh, service and efforts for the common good. The men at Long Hope and their successors in the RNLI, both the, there and, and indeed everywhere else, display, to my mind, all that's best about humanity. Their legacy lives on, and uh, I thank again Orkney's constituency, MSP Lee MacArthur, for giving Parliament an opportunity to remember that sacrifice. The tragic loss of life, that community loss, will not be forgotten. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Donald Cameron, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And like others, can I thank Liam MacArthur for bringing this debate forward. And like others, I too would like to pay my respects to those men who lost their lives in March 1969. And my thoughts go to their descendants and indeed to the community of Brims in Longhope on the island of Hoi. They say that time is a healer, but many local communities uh, who experience such tragedies never ever quite heal. Having seen the heartfelt commemorations in Lewis recently, as John Finney mentioned, for the uh, Isla tragedy, it's abundantly clear that no community ever truly recovers 
from such a tragedy, however distant in the past. And tight-knit island and coastal communities in particular seem especially affected. Um, as Leah MacArthur may know, I stood as a candidate in the 2015 election in Orkney and Shetland, unsuccessfully, clearly. But in that campaign, um, it was brought home to me how important the sea was in Orkney. Um, maybe an obvious point to make, but travelling across the islands, speaking to locals, whether they worked offshore in oil and gas or they were um, uh, part of the fishing fleet or indeed um, were in the lifeboat uh, going on, on call, going out to potentially save lives, the sea was very much part of their life. Uh, and the sea clearly poses dangers as well as many rewards. I'd like to join others in paying tribute to those who do work uh, in our, on our seas and in the context of this debate for the RNLI, the thousands of volunteers who, who, who volunteer with the RNLI. Uh, I think the lifeboat crews provide plainly a 24-hour rescue service in the UK and they have saved over 142,000 um, lives since 1824. Um, they also provide education to local communities. It, community safety teams of the RNLI explain the risks and share safety knowledge with anyone going out to sea or to the coast and they help support people around the world to prevent drowning in areas where there is a high risk. And I'm sure many of us, all of us probably, when we're out and about in local communities, um, we'll, we'll find that it's rare that you don't see a, an R and a life sticker on a car window or on someone's door. Um, and such is the public support for the R and a lie. And it's important, I think it's more in what's said, that we support this terrific organization in, in any way we can. And um, Maureen Watt mentioned that following this disaster, um, it was heartening to learn that um, one of the measures, one of the lessons learned was to develop self-writing lifeboats, which prevented loss of life in 1979, uh, when two vessels from Barra and Isla respectively were deployed to respond to emergencies, both capsized, only to successfully write uh, again with no loss of life to the crew. Uh, like all maritime disasters, it is right and fitting that we remember uh, those who put their lives at risk. And I, I was very moved by the fact that, as Liam uh, MacArthur said in his speech, that the grandson, I think he's Kevin Kirkpatrick, who, um, the grandson of one of the people who perished, now works, uh, and now volunteers rather, for um, the lifeboat crew. Um, and I'm delighted to hear that the descendants of the eight crewmen, or some of the descendants, will remember them by playing the song, The Heroes of long hope at the commemoration. So um, what a fitting tribute in my, in my view. So can I end again by thanking Liam MacArthur for, for bringing this debate to the fore, to allow MSPs um, across the chamber to join with the community um, of Brims in, on, on, in Hoy and to remember those courageous men who were so sadly taken away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Cameron. I'll call on Graeme Deed, close to the government. Minister, please. Presiding officer, uh, let me begin by joining members who have congratulated Liam MacArthur for bringing his, this debate to the chamber because it's entirely fitting that Scotland's parliament should set aside time to reflect on the night of the 17th of March 1969 and the Long Hope tragedy. And alongside that, have an opportunity to highlight the heroism of the crews of the RNLI. And can I pay tribute to Mr MacArthur for his moving opening speech and indeed others for their very thoughtful contributions. The 50th anniversary of that dreadful tragedy in which eight men lost their lives while trying to save the crew, save the crew of the SS Irene. Coxswain Daniel Kirkpatrick, second coxswain James Johnson, Bowman Ray Kirkpatrick, mechanic Robert Johnson, assistant mechanic James Swanson, and crewman Jack Kirkpatrick, Robert Johnson, and Eric McFadgen serves to remind us all of the price that has been paid by our coastal communities helping seafarers in peril. Because it is from the ranks of ordinary men and women living in communities dotted around the coastline that the RNLI crews are drawn from. It is a hugely laudable and frankly staggering statistic that over the 195 years since the formation of the National Institution for the Preservation of Life from Shipwreck, as it was originally titled, the RNLI has, as Donald Cameron highlighted, saved over 142,000 lives. Alongside that sits the sobering stat that 778 crew have paid the ultimate price while seeking to rescue those fellow mariners. And behind that second figure lie so many tragedies which have devastated the communities that crewed 
the lifeboat's concerned. Maureen Watt reminded us of the Fraserburgh lifeboat disaster. My own constituency was touched by another such event, the loss 65 years ago of the Robert Lindsay based in our broad as it returned to harbour from a rescue mission. Six crew perished. The tragedy remains woven into the fabric of the port, indeed, the county, and so too the tiny 30-strong community of Brims and Longhope, which suffered the loss of a quarter of its population with the capsizing of the TGB in 1969. What made the Longhope tragedy particularly awful was the close and lasting family connections within the crew. As we've heard, there will be a commemoration of the tragedy on Sunday the 17th of March at the Long Hope Bay Museum. As William MacArthur revealed, the organization of the commemoration has been led by Kevin Kirkpatrick, coxswain of the current Long Hope lifeboat, who lost his father, his uncle and grandfather on the night of the tragedy. And Kevin's wife, Karen, of course, lost her grandfather father and uncle also. Two families, as well as a small community, left utterly, unimaginably uh, devastated. The RNLI calls its crew members ordinary people who do extraordinary things. They are right. When conditions are of a type most of us would retreat from, the RNLI crews head straight into them because someone is in peril, someone needs help. The comparisons with mountain rescue services uh, that Rhoda Grant drew and perhaps Scottish Fire and Rescue are obvious. And that was reinforced for me last year when I joined the current Arbroath lifeboat crew for a joint training exercise with the local file, fire and rescue. Two different emergency services, but with a degree of commonality around the circumstances in which they are so often called into action. Design officer, like any charity, the RNLI is de heavily dependent on fundraising and donation. And it's pleasing that Scottish Government officials have a long-lasting and continuing commitment to supporting an official civil service charity called the Communications and Public Service Lifeboat Fund. That started in 1866 when a handful of civil servants decided they wanted to buy a lifeboat for the RNLI and raised the £300 it took them to do so. All monies raised by the lifeboat fund since have gone to help the RNLI's life-saving work. Down the years, the charity has supported the purchase of 53 lifeboats as well as crew kit, lifeguard training and the refurbishing of lifeboat stations. The public service charity is the RNLI's longest standing supporter. The Lifeboat Fund celebrated its 150th anniversary by raising £1.1 million for a Shannon class lifeboat, the RNLI's latest design, with the efforts of the Scottish Government staff contributing more than any other single government body. And that's been followed by a new appeal that aims to reduce drowning in Scotland, the UK and overseas. Here in Scotland, children and young people are being helped to stay safe in and around water through a project in Fife, where RNLI lifeguarding is also being supported through the ongoing appeal. To conclude, presiding officer, the nature of the RNLI's role has evolved over its 195 year history, but the selflessness, the courage and the dedication which ran through the crew of the TGB when it set off that fateful day remains the characteristics demanded of crews today. So in marking the 50th anniversary of the Long Hope lifeboat disaster, as Liam MacArthur has afforded us the opportunity to do today, let's acknowledge, as Rhoda Grant called on us to do, the enormous debt owed those who put themselves at risk to assist seafarers in trouble around Scotland's mainland coast and islands. Presiding officer. Thank you. Can I thank all members for their contributions? That concludes the debate, and I suspend this meeting of Parliament till 2.30.